Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Bush. I uh, work at Twitter in San Francisco. And um, today I'm going to talk about real time search with Lucene. And um, as you probably know, um, real time search is pretty important to Twitter. And we are actually, so I'm right now working in the team that um, creates the next generation of real time search. And we are evalu evaluating Lucene. And we are actually, um, we have written a prototype on top of Lucene that uses a little different approach than the current near real-time search feature in Lucene. And we are pretty happy with the results. And we are also in the process, process of contributing it back to Lucene. And some one patch has already made it. And another patch is currently ongoing. And I'm going to talk in this talk about all these things we are, we are doing and um, how it compares to the current um, approach in Lucene. And my mouse is not working. Oh. Okay, so let's see. So um, you you might know that Lucene has since version 2.9 already the feature that we call near real time search. Um, what we basically added to Lucene was the ability to um, get an index reader from an index writer that is currently appending documents which reduces greatly the, the latency, um, the search latency. And um, I will have more slides about this. This is just a quick introduction here. Um, but there's a big drawback of the current uh, approach. If you call this new API that we add in 2.9 very often, that slows down your indexing performance significantly. So um, we at Twitter, we work at a different approach that lets you actually concurrently search on the in-memory data structures that are used for version, and um, we implemented log-free algorithms and data structures for that. But let's start first with the current near real-time search approach in Lucene. Um, so, oh, sorry. Oops, too many animations here, I guess. Um, so Lucene is ever since it existed an incremental indexer. That means, as you all know probably, that um, you can append documents to an, uh, to an index that is already searchable. Um, before Lucene was out, there were a lot of indexers that, that were uh, batch indexers where you basically had to index all documents that you had in one entire batch. And if you wanted to add new documents, you basically had to create a whole new index. Um, and if you ask me, that's probably the biggest reason why Lucene is so successful, that it was always an incremental indexer. My former employer, IBM, actually, for that reason alone, switched to Lucene from their own indexes. Um, Lucene, to achieve that incremental behavior, Lucene writes what is called segments. A segment itself is a small index that is searchable. And when you want to add more documents to an index, Lucene appends more of these segments uh, to the index. And then a Lucene index basically always consists of multiple segments. And you have readers on top that basically hide the fact that you have multiple segments uh, underneath. So this is how it looks. Lucene, if you start appending documents to an index, Lucene will write the first segment. Um, and a segment is, ca you, you can make a segment visible to an index reader by calling index writer commit or index writer close. And after you call that and the segment is committed, it's visible to index readers and searchable. Then as you add more documents, um, a segment in Lucene is always right once. So Lucene never touches a segment again after it was written. So if you append more documents, Lucene would write um, the next segment. And um, that can happen while actually index readers process queries on, on the first segment that was added. Um, and then as you go, you maybe add the third segment. And then at some point, you really don't want to have too many segments in the index because there's a certain overhead of um, searching you know, multiple segments. So it's often better to have a small amount of segments in your index. Um, for that reason, um, there's a segment merger in Lucene that at um, given intervals, which you can um, configure with this um, parameter as a merge factor, um, it, it merges smaller segments into larger ones. And then it deletes the old segments. And um, uh, then when you add new documents, you know, Lucene adds more of these smaller segments until it's time to merge again. And all this merging, merging is um, going to happen then again when you have three even larger segments, then, then it's going to merge it into an even larger segments than, than the number four here. 
So um, committing an index segment to disk usually um, has multiple steps. The first step is, of course, flushing all the in-memory data structures to disk. Um, the next thing is possibly triggering a segment merge, as I sh just mentioned. And then one important step um, for um, ensuring consistency, and Lucene actually has high promises for consistency, so usually you, you should be able to pull the plug off your computer, and it totally crashes, and if you bring back the machine, the index should not be corrupted. So that's what we, what, that's what we promise. Um, to achieve that, we have, a, during uh, a committing a segment, we have to make sure that files that we wrote um, are synchronized, that, that, the, that the computer synchronizes uh, the file system cache with the physical disk. There's um, an explicit step in Lucene that synchronizes these file handles, and that's pretty expensive if you explicitly do that. Um, and then, this is a little detail, we, we, we append the file to like a registry that's a segments file that lists all active uh, segments in, in an index. And um, then if you call it actually index where they're close, that might have to wait for in-flight segment merges to complete, which can also be very expensive. So there's really two things here that are pretty expensive in committing a segment. One is synchronizing those file handles, and the other one could be waiting for merges to complete. And that's the, the goal of near real-time search was um, to improve these two things. So um, what we did was we added a get reader call to index writer that gives you an index reader that can search segments that were already flushed to disk, but they're not committed yet. And with committed, I mean the file uh, handles might not be synchronized with a, with, a with a physical disk yet, and merges might still be going on. And this reduces the uh, latency significantly because you don't have to wait until a commit or close call of the next writer finished before you can actually obtain a reader that, that can search on those segments. But there is a big disadvantage, and the disadvantage is that the get reader call implicitly triggers a flush of the in-memory structures to disk. So every time you call it, Lucene flushes everything it has in memory to the physical disk, which is also expensive. And um, to give you an idea how expensive this is, um, I go a little bit in some Lucene history. There was this famous patch 843, which was basically a complete rewrite of the Lucene indexer. Before um, 843, that, which went into uh, um, the release 2.3, which, by the way, um, improved indexing performance by a factor like 5 to 10x, which is like an order of magnitude. Um, before this patch went in, what Lucene did was it basically created for every single document that you added to index an own little segment. Right? And then with the normal segment merger, after it had maybe 10 of those single document segments, it would merge them into one segment with 10 documents, and that would go on like that. So, um, with 843, a class was devel developed called Documents Writer that can actually take a large number of documents and directly um, encode them into a single segment. And that's, that, that alone was the reason uh, for this dramatic improvement. And um, so you can see that there is a certain overhead of doing frequent segment merges versus using this faster Documents Writer um, approach. So now if we, if we think again, about the get reader call. So in real time search, what you really want to do is you want to call get reader very often because you always want to have a fresh reader that sees the latest results. The biggest, I mean, the, 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 the most important thing about real time search is that you get your late search latency very low, right? That's the whole point of it. So as soon as you start calling get reader very often, you actually end up with the same behavior as before this patch 843, where you actually write a lot of little segments to disk that have to be merged later. So, um, yeah, so the obvious disadvantage of this approach is you get better latency, but you end up with slower indexing throughput. Um, so, because Twitter has very high um, query loads and indexing requirements, we um, are developing a different approach that doesn't have this negative effect on indexing performance. Um, and the goals. We have three goals, basically, for the new approach, which is um, we want to share the, the buffer that the documents writer is using to invert the documents with index readers. So we basically just want to have um, the same data structures that can be used by both instances. And um, 
that, that saves you the step that you have basically to flush it on disk so that the reader can access it. Um, the second goal is that we want to be able to um, index with a high performance, and that performance shouldn't uh, slow down even if you um, use a lot of RAM in memory or if you, um, if you hit the segments very hard with queries, right? Because you want to query at the same time as you're indexing. The third goal is that opening an index reader should be very cheap. Ideally, which would be um, very nice for your implementation, is if for every query that you execute, you can open a new index reader. Because then your latency is, gets very close to zero. That you, you, you get the best search latency you can um, achieve, basically. So, high goals. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few patches that we developed that, um, that help achieve these goals. This one was the first one we already committed to Lucene Strunk. And it changes how per-term data is stored in the index. So if you know how an inverted index works, you know that usually um, all words of all documents that you index are extracted and written into a sorted dictionary. Or it could be a hash table, for example. So it's basically a hash table with all words you have ever seen that points to data structures that contain numbers of documents where the terms occurred in. Um, and before this patch 23.29, for every term that you would ever see in, in a document, we would create an instance of this object posting list. And this, in, this class has several, I think it's actually five, I only put three here on the slide, integers. And um, so, yeah, it holds, it holds five integers. Um, and the dictionary that I just mentioned is basically an array of these posting list objects. And let's see. In Java, this, this is a good thing to know because I had performance promises several times already in projects. It's very expensive to have a high number of objects in their heap that are long-lived. And long-lived means I don't know, like more than a second or something because the normal standard Java garbage collector actually um, runs in different phases. If, um, if, it, if an object is very short-lived, if you, you know, destroy it right after you used it, um, you created it, I mean, um, only a few milliseconds, and it's very cheap. It's almost free to garbage collect it on modern JVMs. However, if you have um, like a hash table with a million objects, which could easily happen here in this, if, if, you have a, if you have documents with a million terms, it can easily happen that for a pretty long time, for minutes, you have hash table memory with a thousand object, objects, then it is put by the garbage collector in a different bucket. And then if you use the standard uh, mark and sweep garbage collector in Java, what it has to do is it has every time it runs, to go through the whole list of objects and, and check, can I garbage collect you, can I garbage collect you, can I garbage collect you? And that mark time, it's called the mark time, that's very expensive if you have a lot of these uh, long-living objects. Um, yeah, so the garbage collection phase becomes very uh, expensive. I've seen, actually, in a different project where we had a, different, a similar problem that you often get pauses in your whole Java, uh, like all threads are paused for like five seconds sometimes because it had to do this, this marking of, of, of those objects. So we, need to we wanted to reduce the number of objects. Right now, the number of ob before, the number of objects were dependent on the number of terms you would see, but we wanted to make it constant, that no matter what documents you have, no matter how many documents you index, you only, Lucene only uses a constant number of objects. Um, so this is a picture how it looked before. You basically had a hash table and um, each each slot in the hash table that had um, had an entry would point at a at its own instance of this posting list object. So what we did was we changed the 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 way we store these integers. We created instead what we call parallel arrays. You can see these for for each integer that was before in the posting list object. We now created the arrays for them. And now when Lucene indexes a term, let's see. Once it index the first term, it puts it somewhere in the hash table, it assigns an ID, and the first term gets ID 0, and that at the same time is the, is the index into the parallel arrays. So it would store the value, the text pointer value for this term in, in the first array, in the first slot, and so forth. So the next term you index is, is 1, and it depends it just to the parallel arrays. So you can see, even though in the hash table, of course, the hash table is never full. We want to usually in the hash table have a load factor of less than 50% or so. Um, even though the hash table is sparse, we can build up parallel arrays that are compact. So we can 
utilize the, sp the storage there very efficiently, and we can grow them very efficiently. And now we only have three objects here. Before we had, and no matter how many terms you add, we can just grow these arrays. Um, we, we don't have to necessarily at the same time keep a lot of objects in memory. Okay, and a nice benefit of this was also that we saved on average per term 28 bytes because the data structure is also more memory efficient because you save some pointers and object headers and that kind of stuff. And now here are some performance experiments. So what I did to test performance was I ran two, two tests, very similar tests. Um, I took one million Wikipedia documents and I gave the JVM two gigs of RAM and the index writer I, said I allowed to use 200 megabytes of those. So it was not even, the index writer didn't even uh, allocate, you know, close to the maximum um, JVM memory. And we only had a 4.3% improvement. And um, the reason for that is that actually garbage collection doesn't have to run very often if you have so much room in your heap. There's no reason to, to invoke the garbage collector. Um, and the 4.3% improvement is mainly due to the fact that we save these 28 bytes per term because everything is a little bit more efficient because you, you save a few megabytes here and there. Then I ran the exact same test, everything like same machine, same documents, um, same setup. The only parameter I changed was I gave the JVM only 256 megabytes of RAM, and now and I still allowed the index writer to use 200 megs. So and suddenly the, we we got an 86 percent improvement, and you can really see the the reason is that with the setup, the garbage collector had to run very often because we came very close to the maximum JVM heap heap space, and um, you can see that this results in and a faster garbage collection runtimes, right? So we have even seen up to 400% performance improvement. It really depends on the documents and how many unique terms they have. Um, and why this is important for real-time searches is that it becomes, of course, much more attractive now if we don't have to flush segments anymore to utilize, utilize as much RAM on the machine that you have available. So ideally, you want to flush um, as infrequently as possible um, because it becomes more efficient if you can build up all those data structures in memory with documents right there. So this is for goal number two, to maintain high indexing performance even if we keep appending documents in memory and the second aspect, independent of query load, I'm going to talk later about. So next, Next improvement we, or next change we're making right now. This patch is not committed yet. I'm I'm working on this huge patch. It's big refactoring, and this picture shows here how currently the um, index handle scene works. So there's this class that I mentioned, the documents writer, and what it actually uses is the green thing is an indexing chain. That's it's like a pipeline of 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 different stages in the indexer that all do different things. And I only showed here like two different um, stages, but there's like more than ten or so. And currently, this whole pipeline is multi-threaded, so that's why I have here those, in the third direction, those boxes that indicates for each thread that you use to index in Lucene, you have for each um, stage in this pipeline, you have an instance. And um, you get a very complicated um, concurrency problem if you have so many, uh, so many classes and, and that have to be thread safe and that have to be able to deal with different threads. So, um, oh, and one thing I forgot here is the interleaving step. So, um, at the at the very end, you want to write one segment, and but you have those different those different um, per thread classes that that index the documents. So you need to interleave the data of that all threads process to to be able to write a single segment. And this interleaving step uh, step can actually be pretty expensive. The other problem is that flushing of a segment stops the world. Basically, that means that one thread executes, a, you know, so, so you call add document, and then at some point the add document call actually causes a flush because the memory is full, and then all the other threads can't do anything because they have to wait until this interleaving step is done. So um, while the flush is going on, nothing happens anymore. And the code is, yeah, as I mentioned, pretty complex. So the change we are making is actually we will make the whole indexing pipeline single-threaded, and the only class that is going to be able to deal with multiple threads is the documents writer. Um, 
and each pipeline will write its own segment. So now you, now you make the problem we have much simpler. Now you, you know that any data structure in your indexer will only be written to by one single thread. And this becomes pretty important. Um, one advantage is, is, of course, they can flash independently, so you don't have to stop this, the, the world anymore. And as I mentioned already, we want to share the data structures between an index writer and the readers to read from the same data structures at the same time. Um, and it, the pr you, you make the problem much simpler if you only have one thread that actually writes. So you, you reduce it to a single writer multi-reader problem. And that makes it possible to actually develop um, log-free algorithms and data structures to achieve this. So, and that was patch 23.24, if you want to check out it out on Jira, it's currently being developed. Um, after we have done that, what we, the, the next step is what I already mentioned, we want to make the documents writer searchable, the RAM of it searchable. Um, we will have to implement an index reader that um, that can access the data structures that the documents writer is using. At Twitter, we have in our prototype implemented that already, and I'm going to show at the end of the talk some performance experiments with it. Um, the hash table is basically used um, that I showed earlier for fast term lookup, and we have to implement term lock and term position implementations for the in-memory posting lists. Um, I have a few slides about sequence IDs if you have at the, uh, time at the end. And um, this is what we do to achieve goal number one, which is that we can share the same data structures between the documents writer and um, the index writers to, to search on the same data structures while we are appending at the same time documents to it. Um, one interesting thing about Java's concurrency is, and I highly recommend anybody who works with Java to read this book that I mentioned here in the last bullet. It's a really good book. I learned a lot of new stuff uh, in it. I thought I knew a lot about synchronization, uh, I mean concurrency. I thought I know how synchronization works and all that stuff, but that's only half of the deal. If you um, sometimes, depending on, on on how sophisticated or how complex your your algorithms are, but um, there's not only locking that's important. Locking you only need if multiple threads you know need to um, modify the same data structures, and that problem we reduce we, we eliminated already by having the single threaded indexing chain. But the other aspect in Java is what's called safe publication. So if one thread, for example, writes you know to variables, shared variables, and another thread is reading it. And so this is a surprising thing. This other thread might see those changes in a different order than they're actually written in, in, in your program, right? So if you wrote you know, first statement and second statement, the other thread might see this as if statement two was already executed, but statement one wasn't. And that's, um, that's another aspect of concurrency. And uh, it's called safe publication that you make sure that um, the threads that are supposed to see a valid state of your of your memory, that um, you you make all those variables safely visible to them. So this is just um, this is this is very important in these log free algorithms that we are designing. That that this play, uh, problem is being taken care of. And again, I, I really highly recommend that book. And yeah, I'm not going to talk too much about that because it's. I guess that, that would take too long for this talk. I, I would love to talk about it, so if anybody's interested, you can find me today and tomorrow. But it, it, it's too much for this presentation. Um, how much time do we have? 15 minutes, okay. So another thing that's going to change with the patch 23.24 is that we actually change the index writer API. Right now, if you have used to seeing, you know that that we have those APIs in Next Writer for editing documents, updating documents, deleting documents, and committing. Um, these methods are all thread safe, so we can use multiple threads to add documents or to update documents. But um, sometimes you might wonder in which order are they actually executed if you use multiple threads, um, and it's actually a tricky problem right now in Lucene, because if if you have this situation here where you have three threads. The first one appends two documents, the, the second one deletes a document, and let's for now assume this term that thread two deletes occurs in both documents, so it would actually delete both documents. And with the near real-time search feature, you are opening an index reader here in thread three. Um, 
and the, the bottom three lines, let's say they roughly are called at the same time for different threads. So now, how do you know what's going to happen, right? Because it's, it's not even up to Lucene, it's up to Java's um, thread scheduling, what is going to happen first. Um, so with thread C, um, only document one deleted. You know, that would happen if the get reader call happens before, or if the delete document call happens before the second uh, add document call. And yeah, which stays with the thread, uh, with, with the index reader C. So since it's currently very hard to track in which all of these things happen in Lucene, we are changing this, these APIs to actually return now a value. And the value is what we call a sequence ID. Um, and the sequence IDs are IDs that are incremental, uh, increment, incrementing, and they tell you un un unambiguously in which order the operations uh, were executed in. So um, an index reader will also have a sequence ID, and that will tell you uh, which what the last operation is that it will actually that it can actually see and query on. So I have another example here. Um, the the yellow and red numbers here are the sequence IDs that were assigned in this example to those operations. So let's say um, the first a document call, of, of course, happened first. And then Java scheduled the delete docs before um, the add document call, but get reader was actually happened before both delete doc and add doc. So what will happen? Um, thread three will only see document one because it was opened before actually the document was deleted, right? And um, so let's change the situation a little bit. Now, um, now the reader was the the reader was uh, call was scheduled last. So now the reader will actually see um, only document number two because the delete call happened after the first document the uh, add document call, but before the next document call. So document one will appear as deleted, and it will see document two. So I have like two more examples, but I guess you get the point about this. Um, so that's very helpful for tracking what actually in which order actually something happened. And that actually can be very helpful also if you implement something like transaction logs outside of Lucene. If you sometimes, if, if your index are crashed and you have to decide what you need to replay of the transaction log, you can figure out exactly um, what operations were already executed and which ones you have to replay. That's a nice side effect. But that was actually not even the main motivation why we started with sequence IDs. The main motivation is how we handle deletes in Lucene. And currently, how we handle deletes is we have for each segment a bit set. And the bit set has one bit for each document in the segment. And the, the, the purpose of this bit set is to remember if a document was deleted or not. So once you call delete document, you flip the bit, in this case for document number two, and then an index reader knows, okay, that document was deleted. So now we need another document. We have two bits that are set. And we open our index reader. And of course, that's a bit set it should see now, right? It should see those two documents as deleted. But what happens now if you um, delete another document? You want to flip the bit, but you don't want that index reader to see that change because um, an index reader should always see a snapshot, a point in time snapshot of your index. So you don't want to see the change. But if you open another index reader, that one actually should now see the document as deleted. So now suddenly you have two bit sets here that don't match, right? So the only, re the only way to make this work with bit sets is actually to, um, to clone them. So every time, and that's actually what's happening today in, if you call get reader, the near real time search feature. So every time you actually open a new index reader, we clone the bit set so that you can have this um, point in time semantics. And let's say you have a million documents in your, in your segment, um, the bit set, needs like 100K, right? So that doesn't sound much, but if you, I know, open um, an index reader like every 100 milliseconds or every second or so, it gets a lot of memory that get, gets actually created and destroyed all the time. So that's a very expensive operation and makes reopening index readers pretty expensive. So the solution here is to utilize the new um, sequence IDs instead of bit sets. And this is how this could look like. So now we don't store a bit set um, per segment anymore to remember if a document was deleted. 
Instead, we actually remember the sequence ID that was assigned to the delete operation which deleted the document. And that's the number we remember. So um, we assigned sequence ID 1 to this delete call and remember that in the array. And then we delete the next document and get, because the next call, sequence ID 2. We remember for document 5, the 2 in this array. Opens index reader now, it sees those two numbers. And now we delete the next document and we actually um, keep sharing the array. So now you see that actually reader 3, we also changed um, the first slot in this array. And I can show you in a second why this will work. So now you see that all arrays here look the same. So we can share them. So in, independent of you know, how often you call get reader and or, or open or reopen index readers, they can all share the same array. No cloning is necessary. And we save a lot of um, expensive memory copies there. And here's why it works. Um, a reader also knows what was the last operation that happened before I was opened, um, which is in those boxes, um, in the index reader boxes, the numbers. So now we don't check anymore is this bit flipped, which tells us if the document was deleted. Now we actually check if the operation that deleted the document happened before I was opened. So now um, the index reader 2 would see um, document 0 not as deleted because the 3 that was assigned to the delete operation of document zero is bigger than the sequence ID two that the index reader one has. Does it make sense? Okay. So yeah, no cloning is necessary as I mentioned already. And um, no matter how many index readers you, you open, they can all share the same array and um, and you don't have to worry about the memory here. And this is for goal three, right? Where we, um, where we said that opening an index reader should be, should be so cheap so that you can, um, for every query, basically open it. So basically now um, in our prototype, th the costs are almost zero to open an index reader, which is really nice. And I'm going to skip these two slides now so that I have some time to show some performance on this. Um, my, my slides that I put online have actually even more slides than, than this deck, um, because yesterday I thought I had more time for the presentation. Oh. Um. All right, so I'm also going to skip. Um, so maybe it's interesting, I guess. Um, tweets only have 140 characters, which is like a nice property, because w what I did was I changed Lucene's posting list format. For every posting, I use just one integer. And an integer is 32 bits, so I use 24 bits to remember the document ID of the, or the tweet ID. And so I still have eight bits left. And uh, for the eight, the eight bits I use for the positions, because no word in a tweet can have a position bigger than 255. So that fits easily into my byte. Um, the only like maybe drawback is that now a segment can't ha ha can't have more than 16 million documents, but that's already a pretty big segment, and that's the only the segments that are in memory. So once you flush them and merge them, of course they can they can be bigger. But um, nothing in Java is faster than reading an integer. So reading the normal scene postings is kind of expensive because they are compressed. You have to decode them. They are delta encoded. You have to uh, uh, subtract and stuff. So um, that's why we, we ran some early uh, experiments and actually decoding these integers is five times faster than decoding normal Lucene postings. Um, so we, oh yeah, and the other thing is, it's also a very nice thing for real-time search because most of the time when you do real-time search, you actually want to rank your documents in opposite order. So you want to show the newest, in this case, tweets first, right? So. Um, this, pro uh, this approach can actually traverse posting this in the opposite order. And it's clear how it works, right? Because they are fixed length. They, they are always like 30, every posting is 32 bits, so I know exactly how many um, bits to skip. And so here I have some, some numbers. So we can index about 60,000 tweets per second. So this is basically the performance you would get from vanilla Lucene. But the cool thing is that this that we can do these 60,000 tweets per second while we actually hit the mach same machine with 20, 000, almost 20,000 queries per second. And I have some diagrams here. 
So the first diagram, they look very similar, and that's good that they do, because the first diagram shows the, um, the, the graph um, how many, so on the y-axis we, we, we have TPS means tweets per second, right, the indexing speed, and on the x-axis we have the time. And in the first test, we actually hit the machine with like these 15 to, t to 20,000 queries per second. And we see that the speed is around like, if you, the average is about like 30,000 or so, or a little less. Um, the graph below is the same experiment, just at this time we didn't query the machine at all. And it's slightly higher the indexing performance, but the problem is actually not here. We, found we, we did some more tests. The, cr the problem is actually not that the log-free stuff doesn't work, that you get synchronization bottlenecks or something like that. The, the reason is actually that we used more threads than for the whole thing than the machine has cores. And you get overhead for thread scheduling, right? Because we use like eight threads to query the machine. And it's, it's a normal thread scheduling problem. It was actually not the problem of the data structures. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, oh, the index just gets bigger? Okay. Right. No, okay. Uh, the question was why, um, what, what, what's the x axis? It's time, and as time goes on, the indexes get bigger, basically, right? So it, we have some, we see some spikes, but there's not really a clear trend. I mean, it's maybe goes slightly down, but which is pretty normal. But um, but there's no clear. I mean, if we would use a near real time search feature, um, I it would be good if I had some diagrams about that. I had, didn't have time to run the tests, but the uh, indexing performance goes down significantly because of this problems that I described earlier. Um, and here we have another graph that shows the tweets per second over queries per second. So what we did here was we kept indexing as fast as we could on a machine, and we increase the query load on the machine. So we, um, we basically um, ran up to 50,000. That was on a smaller index. It wasn't on a very large index. But we ran up to 50,000 queries per second. We actually needed more machines to drive the query load test than the machine that was actually holding the index. Um, and it's maybe going a little bit down, but it's not like you know, dramatically dropping, which you might expect if you have synchronization points in your code. So um, the, 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 um, the log-free stuff works really well, and it's a great improvement over the, over the current um, NRT ap approach. Yeah, and you see here that um, this kind of um, shows that we're on a good track for goal number two to in to maintain a high indexing performance, you know, even while we hit the machine with a lot of load. Okay, last slide, I guess. <coughs> um, this is a roadmap for getting all this stuff into Lucene. So first patch is already committed, the parallel postings array that you know, has, uh, uh, reduces the number of objects. Next patch is a really large one, the refactoring of the documents writer to be, have a single threaded um, indexing chain and adding, uh, well, introducing sequence IDs. Then we have the patch uh, 2346 um, that we're going to work uh, on after is actually evaluating other in memory formats for posting this. You can see that the Twitter thing obviously won't work for all documents. I can't use 8 bits for the positions if I have longer um, documents. But we, just using integers, we actually achieve 5x performance improvement. So we certainly want to change some in-memory structures to um, allow faster query execution. Um, and then we're going to develop, we're going to finish this by, um, by finally making the documents writer render for searchable so that you can open index readers on it directly. Um, then a few more things that we will have to do is um, we need to have an index reader. So imagine you are querying the in-memory thing. And, but then it's time to flush. At some point, the memory is full, you know, and you have to flush it. So there might be queries going on. So you need a smart index reader that can actually automatically, while the query is in flight, keep querying on the flushed one. Or we, we need to have some 
logic there to handle this, these corner cases. So we haven't fully decided how we want to do this. Um, maybe we can also do reference counting and, and wait before we garbage collect um, until all queries are done. But so that's, this is a problem we still have. And then the other thing um, that's currently not supported in, in this prototype is um, a sorted term dictionary. Right now the dictionary is only hash table. So what's not working is wildcard queries and the numeric queries. That's of course something we have to fix because that's an important feature. And um, yeah, we have to implement stored fields, term vectors, payloads. This is especially uh, stored fields and term vectors. That should be much simpler because it's always document centric. Um, so I'm not too worried about that part. I'm more worried about the sort of term dictionary. We need, we need a smart data structure for that. And that's basically it. Um, any questions? Hi, this was Hi. a really interesting talk. Thanks. We're using 32-bit or 64-bit JVMs. I'm sorry? We're using 32-bit or 64-bit? 64 64-bit. 64 okay. Did you try with compressed object pointers either in the Sun X OOM option or the JRocket compressed pointers? You mean pointers? instead of doing this a parallel array? Yeah, just so, just so they use 32-bit references to 64-bit objects, so things are smaller, you miss cache more often. Yeah, I, I mean, that would probably help for um, reducing the memory, but it doesn't help with the garbage collection problem, right? Because the problem was not the, that the objects were actually too big. I mean, it's a nice side effect that we, st that we saved those 28 bytes, but the real big win was that you reduce the number of objects. Okay. Right? So, but I mean, it's a good point. We could try that. But um, I, th I still think um, we, we have to do this parallel stuff. Okay. And it's, uh, it's like a win 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 situation right now, so there were no like, disadvantages, actually. Um, well, I noticed that you um, now stored long numbers instead of a bit in the sequence number arrays for those deleted documents. Of if course. I, if, uh, sorry, can you? Um, you now store long numbers instead of a single bit? Um, you mean the, for, the, for the deleted? The deleted, deleted? Yes. yes. Um, of course, this increases the well, memory usage of this array by 64. Yeah, if you can probably get it down to integers. We can probably live as integers. Yes, it does, but again, I mean, this doesn't have to be the default behavior for like all of Lucene, but for the memory stuff where you actually, I mean, if you're in real time mode, then um, as soon as you have open 32 index readers, you have already saved the memory, right? Okay. So this, I mean, this, of course, you're, you're right. You don't want to do that for all segments that you have on disk. You don't want to switch all, all of Lucene to this approach. This is, this is probably only going to use for the, for the real time mode. That was a good question. I was just wondering with respect to Lucene 2329, the um, parallel posting arrays, you mentioned that the mark and sweep garbage collector was particularly bad. Yeah. Have you uh, experimented with any of other um, Java collectors? I guess there's a stop the world one, if I remember, as well as um, a new one that's been included with Java 6, I think starting with release 16 or so. Um, we have tried one other one. I can't remember the one of it. Um, it's certainly better, but it's still not as good as, as really changing the, uh, reducing the number of references. But I think in Java 7 there's a new one coming, which is going to become the new default one, so that might also help. But for the time being, I mean, this, this approach, as I, again, right, it didn't have any disadvantages um, because it also saves memory, so yeah. That mean, oh, thank you. So you don't want to have so much objects. You use your arrays. Does that mean that I need for each attribute a new array? So if I switch to the new for Pokemon, each attribute, do you do what? So your last point on the sheets yeah. was that you have still problems with payloads, oh, and uh, that, in my opinion, that would mean that if you switch for your tokenizer to this arrays that you need a new array for each kind of attribute? No, this is not, um, this doesn't affect the analyzers. This is really only the, in mem the, the not public internal memory that the, that the index is using. Um, and payloads are actually not stored in that, in those parallel arrays. So those parallel arrays are uh, stored per term metadata. 
So for example, the term frequency, the, you know, the DF, the document frequency, or the pointers where the posting list starts, or it has a pointer into a character pool where the actually text of the, of the terms is stored. Mm -hmm. But payloads are actually serialized into the posting list. They're inline in the posting list. So I actually, the, on the slide, I didn't mean that we have problems with payloads. We just, in this prototype, haven't implemented them yet. So it shouldn't actually change too much how they are stored because, as, again, right there, they are in, in line of the posting list. And the posting list I didn't actually have on my diagrams, on my, on my charts here, um, how, how, how they look like in memory, how the data structures are implemented. Two questions for you, Michael. Uh, first off, uh, how does it compare? Have you, have you done any tests of you know, more uh, search-like documents? I mean, obviously, with 140 characters, analysis doesn't dominate the indexing process. But do you think, uh, how will this affect it as we're dealing with you know, larger text and all of that, where uh, the analysis phase is, is actually the thing that dominates indexing? And then uh, the second question is, when, you know, you mentioned the two different phases, non-real-time mode and real-time mode, I mean, is this the, you know, what are the downsides? When should I not use near real-time and when should I use this? I mean, it seems like it's such a great win that I would just always want to use it, right? Yeah, um, can let me answer the second question first, because it's pressure. <laughs> um, I don't think there's going to be an explicit mode, you know, not real-time. I, I think for readers that you... For in-memory readers that you open, you will always get um, the ones that, that, that can read from the RAM buffer and that use sequence IDs for deletes. But as soon as a segment is flushed to disk you, um, and, and you open an index reader, you, the index readers on those segments on disk, they will use bit sets. But that should all just happen automatically. Yes. I don't have you to think about it as an application No, program. No, exactly. You, from the outside of the scene, you shouldn't have to worry about that. OK. Of course. Um, to your other point, I mean, of course, an analysis is often more expensive than indexing, especially after Lucene 843 was, um, was committed. Um, the index is now so fast that, that you have to work hard on your analysis pipeline to, to keep up with it. But um, still, the near real-time approach slows it down significantly, right? And, and um, what this approach does is it basically removes this this problem was a near real time approach. So, I mean, it's not really making the index faster, it's just not making it slower. Right? right. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're totally right. I mean, usually analysis is, I mean, this prototype here has very simple analysis right now. That's why the indexing, that's why the numbers were so high, right? Usually you probably want to have a different scale out um, approach just for your ingestion pipeline. And that probably really is what helps people decide what they need, right? I'm sorry? And, and that probably helps people decide which approach they can live with and whether they, how real time they can get. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that we will just make this a default. That, I mean, there's no reason to keep two approaches, right? Usually nobody complains when you make something faster. So, <laughs> so that's why I guess it will just be the only API. Okay, thanks.